Is that the verse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can someone shut this fan off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little too much. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 1 The First Step in God Realization, Text Number 13 Katvango Namaraja Sir Gyatva Vyatam Ihai Yusaha Muhurtat sarvam utsrijya Gattavan abayam harim Katvango namaraja sir Gyatveyatam ihayusaha Muhur tad sarvam usridhya Katavam abayam harim Katvango namaraja sir Katvayatam iha yusaha Muhur tad sarvam usridhya Gattavan abayam harim
ladies. Anyone else? <laughs> Kadvanga, King Kadvanga, Nama, name, Raja Rishi, saintly king, Gyatva, by knowing, Iyatam, duration, Iha, in this world, Ayusaha, of one's life, Muhurtat, within only a moment, Sarvam, everything, Usrijya, leaving aside, Gatavan, had, undergone, Avayam, fully safe, Hadim, the personality of Godhead. Translation. The saintly king Kadvanga, after being informed that the duration of his life would only be a moment more, at once freed himself from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety, the personality of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada's purport. A fully responsible man should always be conscious of the prime duty of the present human form of life. The activities to meet the immediate, and immediate necessities of life are not everything. One should be alert in his duty for attainment of the best situation in the next life. Human life is meant for preparing ourselves for that prime duty. Maharaj Kavanga is mentioned herein as a saintly king because even within the responsibility of state management, he was not at all forgetful of the prime duty of life. Such was the case with other Rajarsis, saintly kings, like Maharaj Yudhisthira, Maharaj Parikshit. They were all exemplary personalities on account of their being alert and discharging their prime duty. Maharaj Kantvanga was invited by the demigods in the higher planets to fight demons. And as a king, he fought the battles to full satisfaction of the demigods. The demigods, being fully satisfied with him, wanted to give him some benediction for material enjoyment, but Maharaj Kadvanga, being very much alert to his prime duty, inquired from the demigods about the remaining duration of life. This means that he was not anxious to accumulate some material benediction from the demigods as he was to prepare himself for the next life. He was informed by the demigods, however, that the, his life would last only a moment longer. The king at once left the heavenly kingdom, which is always full of material enjoyment of the highest standard, and coming down to this earth took ultimate shelter of the all-safe personality of Godhead. He was successful in his great attempt to achieve liberation. 
This attempt, even for a moment by a saintly king, was successful because he was always alert to his prime duty. Maharaj Pariksha was thus encouraged by the great Sukadev Goswami. Even though he had only seven days left in his life to execute the prime duty of hearing the glories of the Lord in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam. By the will of the Lord, Maharaj Pariksha instantly met the great Sukadev Goswami and the great treasure of spiritual success left by him is nicely mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Taksu Unmilitam Nena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Sakarine Vanchakalpa, Tarubhishya, Kripa, Sindhu, Bevacha, Patitanam, Bhavane, Bhyo, Vaishnave, Bhyo, Namaho, Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadara, Srivasari, Gauda, Bhaktavrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Killer Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hmm. Over and over again in the purport, Srila Prabhupada said one should be alert. But alert means specifically what is the most important thing to be alert. And that could be described in different ways. Alert to, as it says here, what is the prime duty of life? Nityasiddha Krishna Prema Sadokabunai. Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodi Ayudai. The only goal for the living entity is ultimately to achieve the perfection of its existence. And what is that perfection? It is Prema Pumarta Mahan. To, be, to come to the point of uh, realizing who we are, an eternal servant in love with Krishna. <laughs> that's our only occupation, that's our only identity. <laughs> But we take on so many occupations, identities, and responsibilities. And we take on the material body and we come to the material world. And therefore we have a variety of duties and responsibilities that keep us attentive in those areas. But here, although Maharaj Kadvanga, he was a powerful king. He was such a great warrior that when the demigods were in trouble with the demons, they thought of him, they enlisted him, he immediately and volunteered, and because of his fighting, he, uh, the demigods were victorious. And because of that, they wanted to give him a benediction. But during this whole time, he never forgot who he was and what was his prime duty. He was a king, but still he understood that the goal of life is to ultimately go back home, back to Godhead or ultimately achieve pure love for Krishna. And so he was always alert to that principle. And so when he asked for a benediction, now you might think, if somebody said to you, especially the demigods, the demigods can give anything. <laughs> They're all powerful. They have all the resources. They have all the wealth, much wealth. And they can create a situation where someone can enjoy unlimitedly, materially. And you might, someone might say to you, my dear sir, my dear madam, take any benediction you want from me. Anything you want. Then you might have to think, oh, what would I take? <laughs> Kadvanga, yes. You can't hear me? It's not so, old. how about that, is that better? Is this better? Okay, let's move this up. Okay, they say if your diaphragm is open, you can you can hit, you can speak louder. So when you're down like this, you can't open the diaphragm. So I'll I'll look at the ceiling, and then you can really hear me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, 
So his, he understood his prime duty and that was ultimately he wanted to know or he wanted to think of Krishna at the, at the very last end of his life which was coming at that particular point. And so we might think, well, what would... There was one devotee in our movement. He joined the movement. His father was such a wealthy person. This was back in the 1970s when Srila Prabhupada was there. And his father wasn't so inclined to have his son join the Hare Krishna. Sounds familiar? <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> and some of the, some, we might say, some Prabhupada said, m one of my main enemies in my execution of my Krishna consciousness is the parents of my disciples. <laughs> Prabhupada would say that. And there's many stories in that regard. So this father of this very wonderful devotee said, you stay here, become a nice boy, and I'll give you one million dollars. Now that's 1972. Now how much is that worth now? That's about 30 million dollars now. The one million dollars those days was like unbelievable amount of money. He said no. <laughs> he joined the Hare Krishnas anyway. He refused. And then when he went to India and he helped Srila Prabhupada build the Radha Rasa Bihari temple there, he was one of the main persons working on it. His parents, after so many years, not so many, a few years, feeling separation from their son, wanted to learn more about the Hare Krishna movement, so they came to India, met Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was very happy, very cordial, very welcoming him. And they spoke very nicely. Prabhupada liked the family. But then the offer came up again. <laughs> Please release my son and I will give you one million dollars. <laughs> Prabhupada said, you have to ask him. <laughs> Prabhupada wasn't going to really say anything. So, And again, he refused. That was Giriraj Swami. <laughs> probably, if you probably know the story. And so again, he, uh, he, he understood that, you know, what is money compared to the wealth of bhakti? Um, bhakti is the highest form of wealth because one, when one achieves bhakti, one achieves Krishna. When one achieves Krishna, one achieves everything, even wealth. <laughs> but that's not the goal, of course. So here, Katvanga Maharaj is very alert to what his duty is. And one of the reasons why he was very alert, uh, when he was given the information, he had only one moment left in the world. He immediately fixed his mind at the lotus feet of the, of the Lord. And he turned perfection. Maharaj Pariksha had seven days. But Prabhupada, when he would speak about this, he said, you don't even have, know if you have seven, seven seconds what to speak about you know, a duration of life. I'll tell you a very sad story. You like sad stories? No, nobody likes sad stories. <laughs> but this is a true story. I was kind of involved in it on the outskirts. We were preaching in Mumbai. And we were going to one college, a medical college in Mumbai with the devotees from Radha Gopinath. And were regular programs being held at the university and many of the students were coming and becoming more and more interested. So the programs were going on. And then one night, and there was a, a big program to be held at the universities, the students were coming. Well, one of the leading students, who was also very interested in Krishna consciousness, he said to his friends, his colleagues, you know, I'm going to I'm not going to go to the classes anymore. I'm not going to go to the temple anymore. I'm, I'm going to focus on my studies. I want to graduate top in my class. It was graduation year. So they said, all right, but after you're done, come back. You know? <laughs> he said, all right, I'll be back. So that was, yeah, that was about three months before graduation. So he completely absorbed himself in studies, didn't do anything else, came out number one in the entire college. <laughs> he was given all kinds of awards, best student, number one. 
So, and then his friends said, well, are you going to come back now? <laughs> the devotees are here tonight. We're having another program, so why don't you come? He said, well, you know, there's a party tonight, and it's in my honor, <laughs> and I'm going to go to the party. So they said, uh, well, you shouldn't go, come. But he wasn't going to change his mind. So he went to the party, and they were dancing on the dance floor, and he had a heart attack. He died right on the dance floor. Very sad story. 23 years old, no medical history, top boy in his class in the medical college. When that happened, boy, the devotees who were, not devotees, but the students who were his friends, they became so serious. Because it really illustrates how this material world, padam padam ya vi padam, there's, there's danger at every step. No one knows how long one can stay in this material world. So it becomes important to understand that time is the most valuable thing. Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, money is, is valuable, time is precious. Mm -hmm. Money is valuable, it has some use, it could be used in many ways to do good for others and help yourself, but at the same time, it is not as valuable as time because time goes in one direction. And Prabhupada also would illustrate that. He, sometimes he would be giving a class, he'd stop right in the middle of the class, he would say, it's 7.25 now, and then he'd stop for a minute, and, and he'd say, now it's 7.26, where is 725, 1974, December 13th? You can't find it anymore, it's gone. You can't, if you have millions of crores of rupees, you can't, can't buy it back. So time is precious. Therefore, there's a beautiful saying, and this is from the Sri Sampradaya, there's two things you should always remember and two things you should always forget. And this is interesting. The two things you should always forget is you forget all the good things that you did for others. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a nice guy. I help so many people and I feel good about it. But then you become a little proud and you're thinking I'm the doer and because of me, and you know, other people have benefited. So it's recommended, forget about that. And the other one is forget all the bad things that people have done to you. And develop the mood of forgiveness, develop the mood of humility. And that keeps the mind free, and in that way one can chant the holy names of the Lord. Because if we were feeling angry or vengeful towards someone who did something, which may not be, it had been right, then if we don't learn how to forgive, then that, that crude, I was just giving a class in Bhaktivedanta Manor many years ago. And I was talking about this subject matter. And then at the end of the class, this was a whole group of students coming from another area. And there was one middle-aged lady. She came to me at the end of the class. She didn't want to ask her question. She said, Maharaj, I have something to ask you. I said, what is that? She said, well, you know, I had this problem with this one lady and uh, I can't forgive her. I said, well, how long ago was that? She said, 25 years ago. I almost fell off my asana. <laughs> and I was thinking, whoa, 25 years ago. How can you live with such a mentality? That would be destructive. That actually would do shorten the duration of one's life to have that negativity. But she wasn't able to somehow or other find ways to forgive that person. And uh, it was, I could see she was quite, she was suffering because of that. So if we can learn somehow or other to, uh, and it's not so important what happens to us. What's important is how we take what happens to us and use it for Krishna consciousness. That's the important thing. Because whatever happens to us in our spiritual life, Somehow or other, Krishna either is making it happen or allowing it to happen. And if he allows it to happen, then there's some reason for that. Like I was thinking today, boy, I got to get a ride to get to the class. 
I can't walk. I'm so tired. We danced last night in care time. I, and I was thinking, boy, I'm gonna, not going to be able to make it to the class. And then I called one person. Nobody answered the phone. Tried another one. Nobody answered. I tried my assistant. He's, he's always make sure his phone's off. <laughs> And when I don't need him, he's always around. <laughs> so it's just the way life is sometimes. So I thought, all right, I'm going to have to walk. So I'm staying in Mayapur Institute. So I was thinking, I got to walk. So I walked and I walked and I walked and I walked. I said, hmm, it's not so bad. <laughs> and somehow Krishna gave me the energy. I was late for class, obviously. But, you know, sometimes you just make your plans and then something else happens and then you just have to deal with that situation. And what do you do? You take shelter of Krishna. There's some benediction in there. There's some reason why things happen the way they happen. And there's always the opportunity to take shelter of Krishna. And that's the most important thing. So the two things we should always forget is forget all the bad things people have done for us. All the good things we have done for others keeps us from away from developing this sense of pride. And the other, and the two things you should always remember, you should always remember to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. Always remember Krishna, always remember Krishna. Of course, whatever way you remember Krishna, that's perfection, but the most easy and recommended way, and especially by given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And the last thing is, the one thing that you should always remember is that death can happen at any moment. Padam padam ya vipadam. And that makes one more alert to the value of whatever time they have left. We say, die before you die. What does that mean? There was a book written by Bhakti, Chir uh, I'm sorry, Bhakti Tirta Swami. It's called Die Before Dying. That means there's so many things in our life we are attached to. And, when, and if we die with these attachments, then these attachments can also force us again to accept another birth in the material world. So die whatever those attachments are, whatever they are, understand them, try to uh, see that they're not really important. What is important is our, is our devotion to Krishna because only that is our good fortune. That is our good fortune. Because by, by remembering Krishna and engaging in devotional service to Krishna and using every moment in that same way, one's happy. Even though it's the perfection of one's activity, one feels happy because the anxiety to fulfill material desires or even the desires that are there that we're not trying to fulfill that are still hanging around in our consciousness, they become a burden, they divert our attention away from Krishna. So nothing in this material world can give satisfaction to the living entity. Therefore, the devotee takes heart from such examples as King Kadvanga and Maharaj Pariksit, who gave up everything. Look at Maharaj Pariksit, he was a king of the world. He had a wonderful family, he had wealth on the same level as Indra. And he had prestige, he had so much followers. He was perfect in his duty as a king, he was a Rajarsi. But when the time came, although it was unfair he was undutifully cursed. He wasn't meant to be cursed. Uh, some Shringi, the son of uh, Shamik Rish, he had come into that ashram. Uh, he was thirsty. He somehow or other, by Krishna's arrangement, he would never really act, act like this, but he became angry when he asked for a glass of water and Shamik Rish didn't, didn't respond. The sage was in meditation, simply absorbed in devotion. And the Maharaj Pariksha didn't want to be rejected or neglected. And so he wanted, he responded. He took a, a stick and picked up a dead snake that was nearby. 
He said, you're a great sage, here's your garland. <laughs> and he garlanded him with the snake. When his son found out, Korshamak Rishi understood when he took, broke his meditation that he had neglected this very important personality who was not only a king but a great devotee. But Sringi, 12-year-old boy, although he was, he was born in a Brahmin, so he had some Brahma tejas. And so he used that Brahma tejas in the wrong ways to curse the king to die in seven days. When Maharaj Pariksit heard about that, he thought, here's an opportunity to actually perfect my life. He had the power, Srila Prabhupada makes this point in that discussion, he could have read, he could have read you know, just overturned that uh, curse. He had that power. But he accepted it as the will of the Lord. And therefore, he uh, absorbed himself for seven days in hearing the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. And his questions all the way through the Bhagavatam are really illustrative of how the essence of the Bhagavatam is brought out through proper questions through the proper source, and that is Sukadeva Goswami. So he performed a great service for the entire creation by accepting that curse, but at the same time, he took the opportunity to perfect his life and go back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> so we want to live as long as possible, right? That's the idea. That's the nature of this living entity. Even one in a very wretched condition thinks, you know, I'm going to live as long as possible. Because that's natural. It's just natural. But whatever time we have left, then that, that time is valuable because it gives us the opportunity to somehow relinquish all of our, what we say, material coverings that have been coming from life after life after life after life after life. And they're not so easy. Material, it says that when you perform devotional service, the more you purify yourself, the more you realize how unpure you are. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the attachments to material life are there from so many births, and they're also very subtle and even hard to distinguish. But it has says that before one can actually qualify them themselves to attain the perfection of life, one has to be free from even the time. Prabhupada said, if you have one desire simply to enjoy a sweet ball, that will force you to take birth again. We can, we can eat sweets, yeah, that's okay. But if you're attached to eating, then that's another thing. <laughs> you accept it as the mercy of the Lord, and it's enjoyable, obviously. But when we get attached to anything, whatever it is, then that becomes a deviation in, in our execution of devotional service. And Maya will always remind us of our attachments. <laughs> She's always good at that. She always reminds you, hey, you know, you're trying to become Krishna conscious, and you've been really working so hard to become Krishna conscious, and you're doing everything nicely. But, you know, you should take a little break <laughs> and, you know, go to Goa for a little vacation, you know. <laughs> You know, three days, you know, just take it easy for a little. You can come back. That's Maya. <laughs> Maya's always giving us some opportunity to deviate. That's Maya. She, Prabhupada says, she knows exactly your weakness. Just like when you, if you're in a boxing ring and you're fighting with some opponent, and somehow or other, either you or, the, or your opponent hits the opposite person, and there's some cut or some blood, that becomes a weak spot. And so the fighter will again try to hit the same spot because he knows that's the most vulnerable spot. So Maya is like that. <laughs> she knows exactly where you're weak and she'll keep pushing in that. And then when you cover that spot and you somehow become strong and you somehow refuse to accept Maya's invitations, then she looks for another spot. <laughs> and why? Is she our enemy? Prabhupada said, no, actually Maya is our friend. Prabhupada said that. He said, we have no problem with Maya. She's, not, she's our friend because she's always reminding us 
where we shouldn't be <laughs> or where we want to be but at the same time where we shouldn't be then that helps us to become more determined to take shelter of Krishna. So actually Maya is actually the friend of the devotee in the real sense of the word. So um, yeah. So here in this particular discussion here and you see um, Maharaj Kadvanga. Uh, he could have had anything, any benediction. I mean, demigods can do that. They can, you know, give unlimited wealth, unlimited positions. But he simply wanted to know when will be my last moment. <laughs> Of course, if someone asks you that question, do you want to know when your last moment of in this body is, what would you say? Would you say yes? Or would you say, don't tell me? <laughs> one devotee was doing my fortune one time. I just met him. He had this power, he's somewhat of a mystic. And he said, I can tell you when you're gonna die. I said, don't. <laughs> I'll just plan for it right now, but don't tell me. <laughs> it's, it's like something you don't really want to know, but at the same time it is helpful to know that. So some devotees would like to know that and others maybe would not like to know that. But the fact is, we don't die. That's the most important part of this whole discussion. Death is not for the soul. The soul is eternal. Nahanyate hanyamani sarire. The body is the actual tabernacle for the soul's existence and that comes and goes. The body actually has no life. The body is dead. At all times the body is dead, but the presence of the soul in the body gives life to the body and makes like the body is actually alive. So when the soul enters into the womb of the mother and then the body starts growing, life begins. And then when the soul somehow or other no longer can stay in that particular body, it ends. And the body goes back to a, simply a combination of earth, water, fire, air. In other words, it's just a, a bunch of material elements that have no life of itself. So therefore, we don't die. <laughs> we are eternal. But the body, what we're in, we keep it alive as, as much as we can. We make sure we keep it healthy. The Srimad Bhagavatam says that if you have to focus on anything in your life in order to maintain yourself, keep good health. <laughs> Prabhupada and Bhagavatam says that one should desire a healthy life in order to execute the goal of life, Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada also used to write at the end of his letters, Hope this meets you in the best of health, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. He would always encourage devotees, keep good health, work hard for Krishna, don't waste time, and uh, use whatever time you have left in, in order to serve the Lord nicely and realize Krishna consciousness. Like today is a very special day, it is uh, Bahulastami. Is it really Bahulastami? It's not appearance of Radhakud and Shamakun. So it's the it's the killing of Aristasura. It's in it's in the April. It's uh, yeah. It's it's in the month of uh, what is it? Uh, Chaitra, yeah, in the month of Chaitra. So what is the occasion we are celebrating today? Hmm? Mahaprabhu? Somebody help me with this. I, I couldn't... Or Mahaprabhu discovering Shamakund and Radhakund. Oh, okay. So Aristasura didn't get killed today. It's not his anniversary for going back to Godhead. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. So it's the, the occasion is <clears throat> when Mahaprabhu was in the area of Vrindavan, he was in the ecstasy and he saw this little puddle which is in the middle of a rice field. And he immediately, it was just some obscure water area which is and he was used for growing rice. And he became ecstatic and he went and immediately took his bath there. And later on he revealed that this is actually Radha Kun. And then of course, Raghunath Das Goswami, um, <clears throat> he had the desire to excavate that area and so he developed it and um, one particular merchant from who was very wealthy, every year he would go to Badrinath and, and worship Badri Vatsa Visal and he would give large amounts of money to Badrinath. <clears throat> So this man came to, every year he came, and so he came to Badrinath, and that night he took rest, and the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, don't give your money here, give it to Raghunath Das Goswami, he's in Vrindavan, he will use the money to, for my service. So being a very obedient disciple of Badrinath, he was thinking, who is this? But at the same time, he made his plan and he went to Vrindavan and found Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami was in the renounced order of life. He had nothing to do with, uh, <laughs> you know, pound, shilling, and pence. He wasn't interested in money, but he wanted, he needed some kind of finances in order to develop that area. So, in the mood of sacrifice, he accepted the, that offering and that was used to excavate Shamakund and Radhakund. <clears throat> and you'll see if you go today, even Shamakund is not so even. Radhakund is nicely developed as far as symmetry is there. But Shamakund, <clears throat> uh, many, even before the, the Raghunath Dasko, I think it was around, around the same time uh, I'm not sure of the time period. There were five trees living on the banks of Shamakund. And these trees were actually the five Pandavas who took up residence on Sh in Shamakund. And so, <clears throat> in order for that mm, excavation to take place, they needed to, to take down these trees. But these Pandavas appeared, I believe, in the dream of Raghunath Das Goswami until hey, we're here, don't cut us down. <laughs> so in order, so he, he, he followed that and then now we see because of that. Of course, those trees are no longer there. They, the, the tree actually went back to the spiritual world in that same body. And that was interesting. And um, therefore, today you find Shamakund is not so symmetrical. <laughs> Then you have Gauri Kund, which is the connection between Shama Kund and Radha Kund. And that is, that is, that is actually uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, non-different than Mahaprabhu. I remember in the year 2000, we were traveling in that area and with a large group of devotees and we came to Radha Kund. And uh, Sachi Nandana Maharaj was there and so he was talking to us now, we can all go bathing in Radha Kund. It was about 8.30 at night. It was about uh, 250 devotees. And so he was telling us, you know, what is the mood? Because going into Radha Kund is not simply taking a bath. Srila Prabhupada actually had, had problems with his new disciples coming from America. When they first went to, Prabhupada took them to Radha Kund and they start splashing and jumping in Radha Kund. Prabhupada got so angry, he immediately told the devotees to get out. He says, no more. No one should bathe in Radha Kund anymore. But that's actually not an injunction, that was a reaction to the fruitlessness of these devotees. So then he said, now you just take three drops. But actually it is, recommended and a great 
great service to take bath at Radha Kund, but the mood, and Shachi Nandan Maharaj was just describing for about a half hour what should be our consciousness when we go into Radha Kund. It's very, very humble, very, very prayerful, begging to Srimati Radharani, please give me your bhakti so I can engage at least one drop of that bhakti so I can engage in devotional service with enthusiasm. So it's all about the mood of prayer, not swimming around like some turtle. <laughs> so yeah, so it's a very auspicious occasion because out of all uh, nectar of devotion, I'm sorry, nectar of instructions by Srila Rupa Goswami, explains that of all the places in, uh, throughout the existence, Radha Kun is the highest and topmost of all spiritual places. One who attains to the service of Radha Kun has reached perfection in bhakti. When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was on the planet, and many of the Radha Kun Babaji's who were there at the time and then he was coming into the area, so all oh, they were thinking, oh, this great soul is coming. So they invited him to come and speak. So he came to speak in Radha Kund. And these Babaji's, they were thinking he's going to speak some leelas about, you know, the Radharani. He spoke on Sri Upanishads. <laughs> because, as Srila Prabhupada describes, he said, my Guru Maharaj could understand they were all pretense. They had simply surreptitiously taken up the uh, residence of Radha Kun, but they weren't qualified. They were still engaging in material activities. So if you engage in material activities in the Dham, then you become an animal in the Dham in your next life. But at least you get to the Dham anyway. <laughs> so therefore, one should really understand that the Dham is a, a place for purifying our consciousness and engaging in uh, devotional service, especially in, in Mayapur Dham. Out of all of the moods of Mayapur Dham, the most important mood is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Any comments or questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mishra Bhagavan. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A after you, then he's sitting next. I was, Prabhupada said that we should live a healthy life with a sound mind. Yeah. And like you said, many times you said, take, take care of your health, health is most important. But he yes. also says that there's no such thing as good health. That everybody's going to get old and die and have disease. So how much well, do we balance any, that? Any bodily concern should be done accordingly, but not, not that you focus on that. The Sri Yishupan, I'm sorry, no, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita says there's 22 ways that you can engage in sense gratification. <laughs> and one of them is health. One becomes so absorbed in taking care of their health, it becomes a form of sense gratification. And so, mm -hmm. and so they, that's all they do all day. <laughs> And they think, I'm taking care of my health, but really, it's not that, it, health care is needed, but it should be understood in relationship to proper advice and understanding. In other words, don't make it a project. <laughs> they say, if you lose your money, you lose nothing. You lose your health, you lose something. If you lose Krishna, you lose everything. <laughs>
So there is some value in health. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj Gandavat Pranam. Maharaj, in the purport is written that uh, human life is meant for preparing ourselves for that prime duty. Right. So, uh, strong determination is required. So, for myself, I lack in that determination. So, how to make determination strong? So, please advise Maharaj. Determination is made strong by two things. One is association with devotees who have developed strong determination. In other words, seek out that determination in a form of association. That will also inspire you because association is a very big part of how we develop in our spiritual life. According to the type of association we accept, and then we can either go up or go down. So when we find certain qualities that we want to develop, we, we can also see that the, those devotees who have those qualities, we can associate with them, learn from them, and also serve them. That helps. But Prabhupada goes on to explain determination is weakened by sense gratification, especially sex life. Sex life will destroy determination fast. And so the more you can be free from the tendency to engage in material sense gratification, the more determined you can become. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maharaj, in the uh, calendar, it is written that today is Bohla Ostami, an appearance of Radha Kun. So it is not today. It is written in that calendar, Vaishnav calendar. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. The devotees were giving me the... So it is written, it is appearance day, today is the appearance of Radha Kun and Bohla Ostami. It's written in the Vaishnav calendar. Yeah, but it's not Bahulasmi, it's just Published a from Mahapur. Yeah, two or three years ago, the GBC had come up with a understanding that this is a mistake. We were always celebrating it in Kartik. But they said it's actually in the killing of Aristostora, which led to the whole Leela of Radha and Krishna you know, developing their kuns actually happened in April. But the devotees were informing me that today is the time when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu discovered Radha Kund after it had been lost for hundreds of years. So that is today's celebration. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Maharaj, when Srila Prabhupada was asked that how long does it take to surrender to Krishna, he replied, one moment. Yeah. And in today's verse also, right. it is mentioned, Khatvang Maharaj, just one moment. Yeah. Krishna, yeah. I'm yours. So Maharaj, practical experience seems to be a little different. <laughs> is it possible to surrender in one moment? Is it possible for everyone? Do you have any practical example? from today's life, uh, just one moment. Is it possible for everyone? Well, that moment will come. <laughs> and if you're not ready, <laughs> you can't say, well, uh, you know, give me a few more moments. I got a few plans I haven't finished. It's not going to work. So practice. Practice in getting ready for that moment and by using every moment to become Krishna conscious. There's a very powerful verse from the Padma Purana, which is quite amazing. It, it, it's kind of rhetorical. It says, what is the greatest mistake? What is the greatest anomaly? What is the greatest misfortune? After posing that, those questions, greatest mistake, anomaly, and misfortune, what is the greatest? It answers the question to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment. That's the response. As Soon as we forget Krishna, all of a sudden we're in a different energy. <laughs> and that energy is not stable. Can, can do any, anything can happen when we forget Krishna. Of course, Krishna protects his devotees, even if we forget him, 
he helps to re helps us to remind of us that we should be remembering him and he may even even if you forget him he may even help you to remember him when you forget him because he sees this devotee wants me but the most important thing is we want Krishna we don't want anything else if you keep that focus just like one of girl said to Srila Prabhupada, we're out on Sankirtan, we're distributing your books, Prabhupada, but sometimes we're so absorbed in our service, we forget about Krishna. Prabhupada said, if you're out distributing books and you, and you somehow or other, that moment of death comes, because she said that, if that moment of death comes, Prabhupada said, then Lord Chaitanya will force himself into your consciousness. In other words, that's the mercy of the Lord. He doesn't forget his devotee, even if the devotee forgets him. But don't take advantage of that. That's the point. <laughs> it's not that we should think, oh, yeah, Krishna's there, and, and if I don't remember him, I still like him the best, you know. No, you know. That's why Prabhupada said, <clears throat> what is that? Manmana bhava mad bhakta mam yaji mam namaskaru he said, this is the verse that sums up everything. Always remember Krishna. And Krishna is nice. <laughs> He's nice. To remember Krishna is like nice. Someone asked Prabhupada, are, are you always remembering Krishna? Prabhupada said, I can't remember a time when I wasn't remembering Krishna. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, can you please share a pastime of uh, the prisoners that they surrender when they are condemned to death penalty or something like that from your preaching in jail? You want to hear a story about jail preaching? <clears throat> well, I have one real long one, but maybe the time is not allowed. I can give you a short one. And this happened just recently <clears throat> where this was during the the, when, when the coronavirus was very strong. It was in, back in the year 2021, right at, in January, around that time. So one young man in America, the whole, many of the people in jail got, got coronavirus. But the jail authorities were not going to do anything to help the, the inmates. They were going to give him any medical care, nothing. So this one young man, he had met the devotees and he was chanting. He just started, he was quite new. So now he's thinking, I'm gonna die. I'm getting no, no help at all. So he just went into his own place and just started chanting, that's all. And he just kept chanting, 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 chanting. And he was praying and chanting. <clears throat> and after a few days, coronavirus was gone. The virus left him. <clears throat> Krishna actually cured him simply by the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Nice story, huh? That really helps us to build faith in the holy name. <clears throat> he writes about that. He wrote me a letter explaining the whole situation. He said, now I really want to become a devotee. <laughs> he was new at the time. He was just, you know. He had some faith. It was actually, he didn't know what else to do. All he knew was the holy name. He didn't have any support. So he thought, I'm just going to chant and pray to God. Yeah, it's nice. <clears throat> yes, another any question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a very wonderful class. Maharaj, you spoke about the importance of having the right kind of consciousness. Uh, especially when we are in the Dham and keeping the right consciousness is most important. Why we appreciate that, that is where we have the biggest problem. Uh, I am in the Dham for close to two weeks, but I can't say how often I had the right kind of consciousness. It's always a struggle. So what is the best thing that we can do? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. When you're walking, chant, when you're chanting, chant. <laughs> when you're fighting with your wife, chant. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, just chant Hare Krishna. And 
if we ch practice chanting more, then that chanting starts to develop internally. And then we can chant even within the mind when we're not even chanting. So practice chanting. And of course there's reading Srimad Bhagavatam is non different than Krishna. Seeing the deity and offering our prayers to the Lord, that's remembering Krishna. Uh, seeing prasadam as being non different than Krishna as we honor it, that's remembering Krishna. Uh, seeing that the devotees are actually uh, opportunities for me to offer service. This is, this is remembering Krishna. When we see the other devotees, we shouldn't think, well, these are just other devotees. They're, they are actually opportunities for, some, for service for me. How can I serve the devotees? That will help you to remember Krishna also. Practice. It doesn't come right away. But Prabhupada said, just practice, and so, practice, practice. Okay, thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.